Welcome to the Michigan Repair Monopoly Solutions, proposal by Team Front Row. We are a group of Wayne State students interested in being able to repair what we own. First off is our team leader, Zhang Hoju. He is a mechanical engineer who is a member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Next up is Robert Torres. He is a Marine veteran, the treasurer of peer hackers at Wayne State, and on the road to becoming an AI architect. Then, Asan Hamoud is a computer science major who spent many years as a Michigan certified auto mechanic. Fourth is Mustafa Ismail. He is a civil and environmental engineer, and he is a member of the Engineering Society of Detroit. Last is myself. I am Matthew Piotrowski. I'm a biology student with a focus in human medicine. A quick outline of the presentation will be a bit of history and the problem slash opportunity this has created by Jung Ho followed by primary research done by Assam. Robert will show some secondary research findings about the repair monopoly in Michigan. And then we jump back to me for an overview of solutions before Mustafa gives the criteria for evaluation and evaluates the solutions. Lastly, we go back to Jung Ho, who will close and give our final recommendation. Take it away, Jung Ho. Hello, my name is Jung Ho Ju, leader of Team Front Row. I'll be talking about the problem slash opportunity statement. Oh, until 1996, cars were only of engines, gears, seats, etc., all analog. However, according to careauto.org, big changes happened after 1996. The federal government required car manufacturers to put ECUs, or for electronic controls unit small computer be placed into their vehicles to <clears throat> for diagnosis purposes. Much to this primary intention, car manufacturers put more and more digital systems into their cars to have them run at peak capacity <clears throat> while, reap while reaping in profits from dealership electronic repair for services. For example, a Chevy Impala's ECU replacement costs from like $345 to $523. The, ban the bad news? Like, the ECU is just like any other machine, needs regular maintenance and, and updates. Any mechanic who wants to even diagnose the machine must consult the car the car's, car's manual or specifications. With proper information, it is possible to modify the, the car system so it will be more, more powerful or more efficient. The companies have the full right to ECU repairs and do not want to share the information because of potential prof profit loss. To make matters worse, the federal government passed the DMCA, or Digital Millennial Copyright Act, in 1998, giving the car manufacturers a good reason to crush any attempts of ECU repairs outside the dealership, with regardless of any reason. Still, something can be done to stop this monopoly. The RTRA, Right to Repair Act. When Massachusetts passed this, car makers had to make every information necessary to repair their, their vehicles available, <coughs> giving other states hopes of passing the act in their own state. When Michigan passes the RTRA, this will increase trade school attendance because more mechanics will be in demand for shop because of shop competition, this will improve the overall economy. Change must happen now. More than three me million men and women's tech jobs are at risk. All right, thank you, John Bo. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Asan Hamoud, and I am a computer science major here at Wayne State University. I am also a former state certified auto mechanic for the state of Michigan. 
Now, before I jump into the primary research, I do want to talk a little bit of cars as they are advancing rapidly now with more technologies being incorporated into them. And with these, with these technologies comes the requirement of, of more training, more knowledge to repair these types of things. All manufacturers today currently conceal their trade secrets from independent auto repair owners, and typically they're about 60 to 75 percent more expensive than an independent auto repair owner, auto repair shop when they are repairing these vehicles. Now these trade secrets are detrimental to consumers, small businesses, and mechanics. These three groups are the folks of the primary research. The primary research was a survey that was sent out to uh, local businesses and uh, to the consumers here. And we say people that drive cars, people that own cars. And as I said, they are similar to the survey that was taken by Lake Research Partners in 2006. In that survey, it showed a four to one strong support for a right to repair act. Now, in 2014, a memorandum of understanding was signed between different coalitions and auto manufacturers. This was never signed, never approved by AAA, and it's really a voluntary act. It's not the, NASH, the NASTF, that's the National Automotive Service Task Force. They have set up a website to enforce this memorandum of understanding and they list OEM service prices and who to contact in order to get that, that repair information. This, however, does not benefit consumers, nor does it benefit small businesses. In the current, in the current memorandum of understanding, it's written that the repair shops still do not have access to GPS-related repairs. So we took, our first initiative was to take the independent repair shops and survey them and see what they lacked. We want to know the knowledge, what trainings the mechanics have, what, what certifications they have, can they repair ECUs, electronic control units, and their credentials, if they're ASC certified or not? And we also asked the general knowledge about if they, have, if they know about the NASTF website that is there to help with available resources. We asked them which available resources are available, whether it's for parts, for tools, for repair information, how easy it is for them to retrieve that information or get those parts. And also, generally, how their business is growing. Is, is this memorandum of understanding actually helping them, or is it hurting them, or doing nothing at all? We want to know like their daily car counts, take into factors, how, how often they turn away customers, and the actual costs associated with access to the repair. Our independent repair shop survey, it indicated that the mechanics they lack needed resources, and these issues are almost impossible to fix without this repair information. They also noted that the, national, the NASDF site does not have any kind of use for them, and the cost for repair access that outweighs the benefits. Through the survey, we, we've seen a very, very strong support for the Right to Repair Act. And now we're going to move on to our consumer survey. And this pretty much one, you know, the ownership, ownership status, like how often people drive, how many cars do they own. In, in the state of Michigan, on average, typically a household has two cars. People own two cars. Perhaps. And we also want to know the knowledge. Do they know anything about ECUs and uh, about ECU, repairing an ECU and how they could only go forward their vehicle to a, to a certified dealership to, get at, to have those repairs done. We also want to know about the repair experience overall. How, how long did it take? What kind of cost did they incur and while getting their car repaired? And if their vehicles were under any type of warranty to cover for these repairs. And the support part, we, we want to know, would, would the residents of Michigan want a right to repair act and see, and see how it's actually stopping them from going through? Through our consumer survey, we're able to tell that most people own or drive a vehicle. I'm sure most of you drove, drove a vehicle here today or were in a vehicle to get here. And when cars do fail, less than 50% of the, of the people we polled actually take their car to an independent repair shop. Numbers should be typically higher than that if we want small businesses to flourish, but if they're being forced to go to the auto manufacturer to repair their vehicles, then we definitely have an issue. Most consumers spend about three to five days getting their vehicles repaired, and in this time they incur costs to either rent a vehicle or call up an Uber and, or on some other type of ride sharing just to get around. We also know that consumers don't know anything about an ECU, and they don't even know that a manufacturer is the only one that can repair that ECU. So obviously this in turn gave much stronger support than we thought for, for a right to repair act in Michigan. To conclude, we know that the problem does exist in Michigan and consumers are paying for it, small businesses are paying for it. 
Consumers are paying more out of pocket for repairs than they should. They're being left without a car for days at a time, sometimes weeks. And uh, education on decline is, is also on decline because mechanics aren't even interested in getting that knowledge because they have no, they, they can't even access the repair information to use it. And as I said, consumers spend more time, more money, and uh, it's time to give these consumers and these small businesses repair quality. Let them, let them flourish as businesses. Let the consumers have the opportunity to choose where they want to go. I'll now leave it off for secondary research, which was done by Robert Torres. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, my name is Robert Torres. I'm here to talk a little bit about secondary research and the efforts that have gone into the Right to Repair Act as of today. Um, the, the Motor Vehicle Owners' Right to Repair Act has followed in the footsteps of notable movements like Occupy Wall Street and the anti-tax movement of 1765. Essentially, what has happened is that consumers are sick and tired of corporate structure and being told what to do with their money. Effectively, right now, consumers are trying to fight back with the Right to Repair Act that will enable them to repair any type of electronic that has to deal with their motor vehicles or their cell phones or any other electronics that they own in their home today. And also, it empowers consumers to take whatever income and, with that purchasing power, own their property outright from the corporations that are trying to prevent them from doing that. Previous efforts had to deal with individual litigation, uh, which essentially was extremely time consuming and expensive, and, and expensive for the repair association to continue doing. And it also didn't have the impact that would necessarily create the kind of culture that they wanted to see with the entire movement. What that limiting scope did was it prevented individuals from making any kind of manipulative uh, repairs or altering their electronics from any kind of manufacturer, whether it be a retail chain or a professional auto manufacturer. And the eventual adoption of Massachusetts provided the legitimacy that pioneered a framework to shape the future of the movement. Current efforts are essentially to educate and seek political alliances to allow mechanics to operate without the added expense of special licensing and also to let them know what's in their user end agreement. Moving on to support, there's a host of organizations and unions which support the passage of the Right to Repair Act and they're also seeking for federal impl uh, implementation to combat corporations and the structure that is limiting them in their efforts. And one of these foundations is the Repair Association. The Repair Association was formulated to become a community for service industry professionals and also help them fight back against whatever kind of manufacturer is trying to limit them in completing their tasks. And essentially creating the Right to Repair Act became a cost-effective solution um, that is widely popular with consumers who are frustrated with the yearly upgraded lifestyle of Android and Apple. Um, one of these stories that have been released recently is where Apple is trying to throttle their phones and make it so consumers have to purchase the new phones and cannot use the old phone due to software inefficiency. And one of these new corporations that we see that is making moves in the industry is Tesla. They're creating vehicles with open source software and all of their diagnostics and everything can be fixed independently by consumers and service repair professionals without the overview and oversight of a corporation that is trying to limit their income. If they succeed, um, it could alter the automotive industry forever and for the good of the consumer and the good of uh, manufacturers. Now I'm gonna speak a little bit about the opposition. Um, the opposition in this case are corporate giants that use lobbying tactics and um, that have changed their corporate eth ethics ever since the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, which essentially was the uh, financial collapse in America. These corporate tactics uh, resulted in very unethical and extremely volatile movements by corporate structure. They did whatever they could to maintain the overhead and prevent bankruptcy and this essentially turned them into a profit first corporate, corporate structure as we see today. That mentality has been a bane on consumers since the collapse due to the fact that corporate corporations are trying to 
prevent them from owning their products outright. But if the profit first mentality can be changed or manipulated in any way, um, investors and consumers can reach common ground by enacting the Right to Repair Act at, at, at the federal level so that the business model for manufacturers can also make. But from what we can see, if the investors and consumers can reach common ground and corporations can make a bulk of their money on the back end instead of the front end, uh, the Right to Repair Act being enacted in a federal level will support both the consumer and the manufacturer equally. Now, uh, back to Matt. Thanks, Robert. So here we have the solutions. I'll just be giving a quick overview of them all before Mustafa goes into more detail and evaluates them. Our first solution is to do nothing and keep repair systems the way they are right now. This is a very simple solution, and the one everybody defaults to. It's not a world-ending problem, right? We don't need to deal with it now. If anything happens to our vehicles, we can just take it to the dealership. This is the complete wrong mentality to have with this solution. If the corporations are left unchecked, they will have a monopoly on the repair of products and be able to demand steep prices for repair. Prices so steep that sometimes it is better to just buy a new product and then get your current one fixed. The second solution is to negotiate with manufacturers to release information. This is another fairly simple option and concept. We tell the manufacturers what we want and why they don't completely lose out as well. Then both parties go away happy. This would function similarly to when unions were collectively bargaining for the rights as workers. We would have to convince manufacturers to take a loss of profits at the front end and persuade them to build brand loyalty and increase aftermarket profits by allowing more people the ability to repair electronics, and giving more people access to these repair parts. The final solution is to bring the right to repair act to Michigan. This has been shown effective in states that currently have this implemented. This solution requires the government to act for the people and to make large businesses do something, and requires the most steps out of all the solutions. However, nothing worth it comes easily. Now for Mustafa with the criteria and evaluation. Hello everyone, my name is Mustafa Ismail, Team Front Row, and I will be talking in more detail about criteria and evaluation of the solution. To determine which solution is the best, the following criteria has been chosen as a guide to evaluate the solution. First, repair cost. A big part of the desire to change its lower repair cost, both money-wise and how long vehicle repairs take. Second, how will this affect consumer choice? This is determining if it will have a positive or negative impact on consumer choice. Based on research we have done with consumer surveys, most people would like freedom of, of choice where they can repair their vehicle. Third, independent auto repair effect. This is important because currently independent auto shops must pay service fee to get access to the electrical rights and information to vehicles. We will determine if the solution could possibly increase, decrease, or have no effect on these costs. Fourth, effectiveness of past attempts at these solutions. These solutions might not be novel, so if they have been previously attempted, how did they work? What outcome did the area experience? A good solution may have been previously implemented in other, in other areas and should be given more merit if it was successful. Evaluation of the solution. Do nothing and keep repair system the way they are now. It will have no impact on the repair cost. It will continue to stay the way they are. Consumer choice will also be unaffected. They will st still be forced to go to a dealership mechanics for ECU related repairs. Independent auto mechanics will still be unable to repair the ECU related issue unless the mechanics pay for the information from the manufacturer. Second, negotiate with the manufacturer to release the information. Negotiation with the manufacturer for the release of the information should lower repair cost. If multiple places have access to the information and can repair ECU related issues, then competition will arise to decrease prices. If manufacturer 
release the information, then consumer should have more choice where they can repair their vehicles. Also, if they made it public, people can choose to repair their vehicles themselves. Bringing the Right to Repair Act to Michigan. Bringing the Right to Repair legislation into Michigan will reduce the cost of re repair, both for individual and independent auto mechanics. With the Right to Repair Act legislation requ required to release the information and the availability of the, of the spare parts for repair. Also, auto mechanics and consumer will be able to get all the information they need to repair without going to the dealership. Right to repair should be difficult to pass. However, with the help of repair.org and any other group that are interesting to get these law passed. Since this opposition has been overcome in, in many different states, Michigan should not be any different. Hello, it's I, the leader again, to talk about the final part of the proposal. Recommendation. Based on our research, we highly recommend bringing the RTRA to Michigan by submitting it to state congress so they can review it and vote on it. The act is beneficial not only to owners but allowing them to fix their own cars better, to better than factory conditions but to the independent mechanics as well because the information would be readily and easily available for them to fix any vehicle electronics at a lower price than dealership services. Shops would fix more vehicles competing with each other, increasing demand and incentive for prospective mechanics to work after trade school. Competition will improve the overall economy also by lowering car mechanic unemployment. However, car companies will benefit as well by selling more vehicle service parts, increasing their profit margin. Of course, if owners cannot do, do repairs or shops cannot do them, dealerships are still available to repair vehicle electronics. Dealerships can keep their usual repair prices and duration as rates before RTRA. Difference after that? Owners have more options to fix their specific needs.